Greetings, everybody. I'm Peter Denning, your host for the Harnessing AI course. Welcome you today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, security and adversarial AI, which is a very interesting area. Computer security has been a, a long-standing topic of interest in computing ever since, as far as I can remember, back in the 1960s. Everybody was always inter interested in stopping intruders from getting in and stealing data and disabling systems. And as the internet grew over the years, this problem became more and more severe. And then now is a major area of study. You, you can even get a degree here in, in that topic. Um, in the last few years, machine learning has come into the picture and made it even more difficult to, to uh, counter the threats that come from people who are trying to hack into systems and steal data. So this is a very important topic, and we'll be talking about that. This t topic also marks a kind of a little transition in the course. Up till now, we've talked about the different kinds of AI machines that exist. Now, for the next several lectures, we're going to be looking at application areas where we take these machines and try and solve problems with them. So we put the, the security problem on top of the list so you can uh, interact with an expert on that and answer some questions. Our speaker today is Britta Hale. She's an assistant professor in the computer science department. I think this is your third year there mm -hmm. now, so she's become years. well acclimated to our environment. She has a master's degree in, in cryptography from the Royal Holloway University of London and a PhD from the Norwegian U uh, University of Science and Technologies. So she's well connected in Europe as well as in this country. So please welcome her. All right. Well, thank you. So about a year and a half ago, the most popular searches on Amazon included terms like laptops and cell phones and Nintendo Switch. And roughly three months later, in a space of about a few days, we started seeing spikes in search topics like face masks and hand sanitizer and paper towels. Now, this was indicative of what was happening in our day-to-day -day world up top, but also had a very direct effect on the businesses behind the scenes because Amazon and its affiliates in data analysis were already using machine learning algorithms. So when searches started spiking in these odd categories, we're affecting things like supply chain and just knowing what to buy and advertisements, how to sort uh, the best selection for people because Nintendo Switch wasn't their favorite choice anymore. And also fraud detection. These algorithms were trained on data from the months prior. And when something starts spiking on paper towels, it thinks that fraud's going on all over the place. And now people are inundated with false intel. Now, why is this? Well, basically for the reasons I just stated, that these machine learning algorithms were trained on what existed. They were not prepared for a pandemic. They were not trained for that. They were brittle. This wasn't a cyber attack. This was a real world interaction, but it had a very strong effect on the usefulness of the machine learning algorithm and the, what it was telling the users. So how would this affect you? Beyond fraud detection, if you consider a similar case, for example, UAVs. You have a port, you're using machine learning to detect uh, ship activity and alert you of people coming into a closer restricted area, and it's trained on data from the past several years. It's not trained for the swarm of UAVs that comes in out of the blue. And whenever there's unusual activity and you're getting false alarms, or just an abundance of weird alarms, uh, then the, the actual operators, they don't know how to react. So in this talk, we are going to talk about machine learning and cybersecurity. 
we're going to go beyond just the brittleness, because that is our first step, how to make these, or what to be prepared for with these algorithms so that they're stronger, and then right into the adversarial zone. So how an adversary can use these. There are two general categories when we talk about machine learning and security. One of them is how does a secure machine learning? That is a good place to start. And what becomes very interesting to a lot of people is how to use machine learning for cybersecurity. Uh, that's a hot topic. We like to apply it. And if it's a magic pill, then why not? But it's not a magic pill. And if your machine learning is insecure, then there's no reason to apply it to cybersecurity. So we need to start with number one here first. Now before that, we actually need to start further back. Whenever we talk about security in any instance, we talk about it in the context of the adversary. Something isn't simply secure. It is secure against certain actions. So they're preventative. So we need to actually talk about how to break machine learning. OK, so thinking back to the Amazon example, what really went wrong? Why was it brittle? Why were these algorithms brittle? Well, basically, when they were tested, they were tested for accuracy. The fundamental question being, does it seem to work? Now, there's various ways that they ask this question, various tests that we do, but it's all about accuracy. Does it do what we expect it to do? Well, that's great. But wasn't, what wasn't asked in this uh, situation was basically everything else. All the ways to circumvent the algorithm, all the ways to abuse it, to be prepared for all the alternatives. Think about this, if you were buying a car, you would want the designer not simply to test for accuracy and make sure that it passes certain speed limits and has an engine and whatnot. You'd also like them to go to crash test it. And you're probably not going to buy it unless they do. That means taking the model and using it in a situation that's not intended to be used and seeing how it behaves. So that everything else is really our weakest point at the moment in machine learning. There are two general categories I'm going to cover with attacks. One is attacks during training. That's when we have the data itself. And then attacks during production, once, it, once you have a machine learning model and are ready to use it. So during training, we'll talk about data poisoning, trojans and backdoors. So training, I'm going to give you a bunch of data. You are going to build a model out of that. What happens? Well, machine learning model is very much like a child or a student, brand new student to a domain. How do you learn? Well, you're going to try and memorize everything you see. Uh, that's the first inclination. You don't yet have a method, you're just going to memorize. So if I say, here's a photo, and it shows a ship, what does a machine learning algorithm do? It doesn't know what a ship looks like just yet. Instead, it's going to collect information from all over and all types of information. We might notice that it has a black hole. We might notice that there's people. We might notice age, glasses. We might notice ethnicity. We might notice that rope is blue. And it's just collecting all this data. You don't know what it's memorizing. It doesn't even know what it's memorizing. And then as it begins to collect all this, and we add more and more and more data to the mix, there's more and more subtle information that it has gathered. And it is memorizing all of it. So now that it has memorized all of this data, and the adversary would like to do something with that unique amount of memorization, how can we poison this? Well, we now have, we're building on a model. We have data. We'd like to affect the inputs. Some things that we'd like to be able to do. Maybe we could change output classes. So I would like to reclassify every UAV you see as a bird. So the, the, I'm going to shift the whole class. Now I can shift this spontaneously without any particular target. Just I don't want you to recognize what a UAV is. It's just shifted. Or I could say I'm going to change it out with the birds. OK, that, that's a general misclassification, but let's get more power. OK, let's get targeted here and say, I'm going to change a particular source to a particular target. So it's fine if you classify all UAVs more or less correctly. You'll you notice if that went wrong. So instead, I'm going to take that one type, that one type I'm going to use in a special scenario, and I'm going to have that one misclassified. 
You can detect all the others, but you won't detect that one. And I could just have it misclassified to anything or to a particular target again. So maybe you would notice that it doesn't look like a cloud in the air, and so if it's just a general misclassification, so the operator will detect it. But instead, I'll classify it as an eagle or something plausible. So let's take a look at an example. In this case, the researchers were looking at a targeted misclassification. We have a picture here. It was we have a label on it as a panda and a percent confidence. So that's about 57% confidence that it was a panda. And then we're going to add a little bit of something to this. A little bit of noise. Now that is not random noise, it's actually carefully selected noise. Okay, but there's going to be a bit of extra noise, it's a nematode. We're going to layer it on top. Blend it in and make a new piece of data. Now, you can't see the difference between those two images. Maybe you're thinking, yes I can. No, you can't. The resolution is too low. So you, there's not enough of a difference between those two images for a human to detect, especially on this projector. But the machine can, because they have the raw data. And then they can see all the little pixel level differences. And what's going to come out, well now we have a misclassification, and it's at a very, very, very high confidence level. So now, I misclassify your UAV to a bird, and I increase the confidence level so that you are absolutely convinced it is only a bird inbound. That is not an excellent outcome when it comes to security. Another example. In this case, the researchers decide, okay, well, we're going to take an image and we'll just place a sticker on it. So instead of doing an overlay of noise, we'll just place a little sticker on it and we'll see if we can affect the classification. So here, uh, the original image got classified as a banana, as a 97% uh, confidence level, so pretty high. We're happy. That, that's a banana on a table right there. Then we place a sticker on the table next to it. And it got misclassified with an even higher confidence level. So if I was an adversary and I was looking at this, I could say, on all of my UAVs of type A, I'll place stickers. And eventually, you'll be training off of images of those and they are all going to be misclassified. Trojans and backdoors. Well, okay, so we did data poisoning, but now let's up the ante because as an adversary, if you can do something, let's do it better. Okay, we want to get a little bit more control. We're not happy to stand there. What is the backdoor? Well, it's basically very similar to data poisoning, only it's a little more strategic. Okay, we're going to actually create a Trojan trigger so that everything classifies correctly except if you feed it one data point. So basically, uh, you, all your UAVs are going to be classified until you hit that something with a sticker on it or that particular design. For this, there's bad news if you're on the security front. Retraining with a Trojan trigger actually doesn't take very long especially not compared to the original model. So you've got a model, you're going to retrain it a little bit, and it can be minutes or hours. Why are we retraining? Well, actually, this is pretty normal in machine learning, and you've probably heard about this in the past lectures. The, the model will degrade with time, you probably update it with the latest data, and we have various ways of retraining models over time. So your opponent, if you're the adversary, and you're targeting this, you know they're probably going to do this anyway, so why not use it? What else? You don't have to access the original data set. Ooh, ouch. On uh, adversarial front, that's fantastic news, but not so good for you if you're working on security. Okay? So with poisoning, someone was modifying the original data. We, we took something out, we put an overlay on that you won't detect, stuck it back in the data set, you trained. Okay? That's sort of, sort of insider attack, or they just broke into your system. Now, we don't have to access the original data, we're just going to feed it some bad stuff in addition. Neither of these are great situations. Here's a, an example of a Trojan. We have a stop sign. If you notice very closely there, it's got a sticker on it. 
real world stop sign and one stuck a sticker on it. And it got misclassified. Obviously, they didn't want to do a high speed, otherwise you know, this guy would get run over. But we can actually misclassify it as a go versus a stop. So then the security question. How do we defend against this? We can try to detect outliers. We'll go through all your data, look for that little sticker, right? See if you can uh, notice it there. Uh, that's one way. The issues. How do you define an outlier? How do you know what's irregular? You might notice a sticker. Do you notice that one blade of grass that's in all your images? Or maybe it's even common to a lot of your images. There is a case where uh, researchers were studying wolves and dogs, and they built a model to correctly classify these. It all looked like it was performing great. And then they tested one particular case, and it misclassified the husky as a wolf. Now, I've been working on huskies before, so everything should have been fine. Turned out, all the photos of wolves were taken on snow. The model memorized snow. It didn't memorize the look of the wolf or dog. It memorized snow or grass. So how do you know if it's an outlier? And even more particularly, maybe you don't want to get rid of outliers. It's actually very powerful to your model to have outliers. Outliers are those refining points, those one-off data points. It's like, OK, well, we got that one great photo of a UAV. We want it in the pool, so we're training off of it. It's nice and clear, crisp photo. Your others weren't. But we want that. Uh, often, if you think of even like statistics and you think of line of best fit, some of those uh, extra data points can actually help refine your model a lot if, in just a statistical sense. Similar thing applies here. So those irregularities, as you might say, those outliers, and especially if people, if the majority of your population looks one way, you want to have a few select other examples, those help refine the accuracy of the overall model. So you actually want those. So now we're into a problem. What else? Well, we could say that we sort the data and, and check it and filter it ahead of time. But probably you already had data in the pool, so you can't retroactively get to that. So you're only sorting for the, the next set that comes in. You're already training on models right now, so if you start your filtering right now, what about the other thousands of examples? Are you ready for that? OK, how about how we take the model? We, we already have a model, so instead we're going to take this and uh, test new data points against it for accuracy. See if anything irregular happens. That sounds pretty good, right? So we'll notice if the huskies and wolves get misclassified. Well, what about the Trojan? The whole point of the Trojan is that it won't be detected by your model. It's going to get through. So that method of defense uh, also isn't great. Oh, and then we have to come to the data itself. How do you protect your data? So if we can start getting into data protection, uh, it is a very, very long discussion. And it would take this entire class, and not just today, but the entire course, to talk about protecting the data in transit or at rest. So I'm not going to talk about that. But suffice to say, this is very hard to do. Because if you are protecting the data well enough, then maybe we can prevent the data poisoning. But as we've already seen in real world plenty of times, data leaks, people get their hands on it, systems are not all that secure as we might hope. OK. So then let's take a different route. We are going to take all of the data into a very secure facility. We will train the model there, and then we will delete all the data, it's gone, no one can ever touch it, we will never retrain the model, no more Trojans, we're good, right? And then we can take the model and go elsewhere with it. So far so good? Well, that leads us to attacks during production. Now you have the model, the adversary doesn't have access to the data anymore, can they do anything? And, well, Turns out they can. We'll cover two, inference and evasion. Uh, there, there's more you can do. 
OK, so what does inference do? Well, inference is about using the outputs of the model to acquire information about the data set, even though you theoretically deleted it and it was all safe and gone, theoretically. But you're using the outputs to make some sort of inference. So it's basically reversing. Uh, there was a study back in, well, six years ago now, where researchers given the name of a particular data point, started querying the model, and were able to reconstruct this image as their estimate of the original data point. The actual original data point was this. That's very close for something that was six years ago. So if you are thinking about, should I figure out who this data was trained on? Can I look at what they're trained, the people, you know, maybe it was an exercise going on, there's photos of that. Can I look at what they were doing, where they were, location? You name it. Maybe we can infer something. Other things, uh, membership and data attributes, that's also inference. So maybe I could infer classification levels, clearance levels. Uh, maybe I can infer what you do, where you do it when you're home, when you're not home, where you might be traveling to, things like that. So this certainly becomes a risk for whoever and whatever data you had put in that original training pool. Inference can also extend to the model itself. Okay, so, the, so far we talked about inference with the data, but we can actually infer the model. So all of this, again, is uh, very, well, shall we say, sophisticated attack. Uh, but basically, all the adversary has is access to outputs of the model. So they're going to give it inputs and outputs. It, it cannot see it, cannot touch the original data, can't touch the model itself. You know, all that's hands off, it's a black box. What it can do is it can query. Say, all right, I will send a UAV overhead and see if an alert goes to your operator. I'll send a bird overhead and see if an alert goes to your operator. So we just kind of do these sorts of things. So we see reactions to your model, and eventually you're able to reconstruct the model. Very, very, very close approximation to it. Evasion. Okay, so we can infer things about your data set and your model, but maybe we can uh, evade it altogether. This is a little different from poisoning in that we are not shifting the classifier boundary of how things are classified, but rather pushing bad stuff into the mix. So. If I go to this trusty uh, birds versus UAV example, what do I do? Well, I want to classify birds as UAVs because I just want misinformation and have all of you panicking all the time. Sound good. Secure weapons facility, everyone, all the alarms go off. What will we do? Well, we'll change bird, the UAVs to look closer to birds. So I take some UAVs and I glue feathers onto them, okay? Make it look plausible. And I keep it labeled as UAVs because the person looking at this the first time goes, well, that's definitely still a UAV. I saw you glued feathers on. No big deal. We can spot that. We know what you're doing. So we keep it labeled as UAVs. No, no problem there. And slowly, we are putting these changed UAVs into the data pool because they're reacting to it and basically making it less and less confident and certain about where, uh, how to classify things. So this, as a general two-category example, is what you're looking at with evasion versus poisoning. With evasion, you're just shifting things so it gets misclassified. Whereas with poisoning, you're actually changing how the classification works. OK, obviously, uh, both of those are bad things. So how do we defend? That's our end goal, right? Differential privacy might be a term that you've heard before. This has been one of our techniques that have been tried out uh, in this respect. What does it do? Well, basically it says, all right, uh, I know you're up to something questionable. Uh, and uh, so I don't want you to infer stuff about my original data set. So if the adversary is going to be able to read outputs, I don't want it to be able to infer original stuff. So at a high level, what happens is that I take various uh, training data sources, and I add a little bit of noise. So there's a little bit of noise added to each uh, training pool. And then it's combined before being put into the model with the intent that the output has so much noise that the attacker won't be able to infer the inputs. Obviously, we can't do this carelessly. 
there's a whole field of study de de devoted to differential privacy and how to ensure that adding so all noise of just the right type gets us just the right amount of output noise. Okay. But as a high level, we basically are throwing off the adversary. What could go wrong? Could you end up corrupting your entire data set? Not just the data set, the model itself. Because we've just thrown a bunch of noise in, right? It's not what we had intended for it to be doing. It's now basing it on bad, you know, slightly bad stuff here. So yes, we could basically affect our model. If we want to optimize on accuracy, now we haven't. OK, well, then what else? We could say, let's not force any guessing. So if it's coming, if the model says it's a low confidence level, it's got that UAV with feathers on it, and it's not sure what to do, what we'll have it do is actually send it into a null class, which then an operator can look at and say, yes, I can see it's this, or no, it's not. Well, that's got the human overhead, which begs the question of why we're doing this in the first place. Adversarial training. So this one gets very fun. Basically, adversarial training says, all right, I know that an adversary is going to try to give me bad data points. So I'm going to make my model robust against those. And I'm going to pre-plan this by giving it bad data myself. I'm going to give it some fake stuff and make sure that it knows how to handle it correctly. OK, sounds good. Right, so we're pre-preparing that model to know what it's going to face and it's exposing it to adversarial data. What if the adversary uses different examples, though? How can you bother? OK, we can't predict everything an adversary will do. So whatever we're doing may or may not align. But it gets even worse. What happens if you train too many adversarial examples? It's part? Now it becomes the norm. Now it becomes the norm? So basically, it's like putting someone around a bad influence too often that they basically get corrupted, right? So we are giving it adversarial examples, and adversarial examples is messing up the model itself. So if we are going to use this to protect as a protection technique and say we are going to use adversarial training, what we can actually end up doing is leading to data poisoning ourselves. So as you can see, we start getting into very much a loop of what attacks to prevent against and what we might be exposing ourselves to if we do. Now, a lot of this is still an open question. And mind you, I've been looking at adversarial examples here. Some of this can happen simply by chance. That's what we just call bias. So it wasn't necessarily intentional, uh, but it happened. It was a brutal algorithm. OK, maybe we just need the human in the loop. Or we'll take the overhead byte, and we'll say we accept it, and we will get someone to look at all of our data to help us along the way. And we'll give them lots and lots of experience with this. Should we run a little experiment? OK, I am going to show you a series of photos. All right, these, I will premise it ahead of time so you've got an edge. These have, do not, are not poison photos. I have not added anything to them. I could, but I haven't. They're all taken from the DoD website, so they're officially taken photos. They're not bad in that way. There's no extra stickers on them. OK? These are all labeled, if you search for it, uh, Marines. OK, so we have the label Marines. I'm going to show you a photo, a series of photos of Marines in camouflage. Now, you are going to inspect them as the human in the loop and tell me if that's a good for training. And I'll give you a few seconds to look through them, uh, but not too long. Because in real world, you wouldn't have forever for every image anyway. Ready? OK. I'm now going to give you a series of photos. And you tell me, based on that training data, 
whether you think the model will correctly classify these. And what you think will be classified as. Marine or non-marine? Non-marine. Non-marine. Why? Most of the pictures before had pictures of dogs and or aircraft and vessels. OK, so you're picking up on the, the surrounding uh, elements. Very good. But it could have memorized camouflage, so it actually could have. I mean, it was labeled that. What about this one? <laughs> you're a very skeptical yeah. group. <laughs> I don't remember them having no, no mass on any of the training photos, okay? Green. Why? It's a dog. <laughs> it's a dog, okay. With a bunch of little kids. With a bunch of little kids. Well, there were, were there little kids in the other training photos? <laughs> and they, they weren't <laughs> smiling at least. Potentially marine. Potentially marine. Okay. You don't seem very confident in our model. <laughs> you made us skeptical. And now, now you're all skeptical. But obviously, as you can see with all these, you know, you classified all these as basically the, the non-intuitive choice, <laughs> right? Now, either we have people that are going to just click through if they're classifying things, or if they're going to be very careful and like you kind of looking at wh what the selections could be, then there's also the risk of never actually adding anything to the data set anyway because you get paranoid. The thing is, you don't know. Was it the glasses? Was it camouflage? Was it the dog? Was it kids? What was it training on? And yes, every single photo was carefully selected to have a dog in it from the previous slide. So we are definitely in a conundrum when it comes to security and machine learning. It's a developing area. Uh, this is not to say we shouldn't use machine learning because it has many, many benefits. But it also comes with risks. Within cybersecurity, um, various things have been done for security of assessments of algorithms and networks and software. Machine learning, I'll, I'll align it to software as an example. In software, we use something that might be called the DevSecOps approach, basically, that you want to integrate development, operations, and security at the same time. People take, there's no true definition of this, so people take different approaches. One very good way would be to say, take someone who knows a lot about operations, someone knows a lot about security, and someone who knows a lot about development, and get them to talk to actually figure out what they're doing, making sure it fits the need use case, the security goals for it. If we apply this to AI, well, I could say DevSecOps AI, or maybe just Dev AI Ops would be a good term. But essentially, there's no way where we can press the magic button that machine learning is going to fix things and we should be using it for security if we're not sure what we're securing against. So on that note, I will take questions.